So, you like tabletop gaming, but what if nobody else around you plays? Today, I want to go through some of the things I have done and plan to do to jumpstart an oasis in the gaming desert. Hey there, Philip here from Manning the Fort, and while I really do love making tabletop gaming content, there's a reason my channel thus far has really only stuck to painting and lore videos for Warhammer 40k. See, I live in a small, rural community about an hour and a half from the nearest friendly local gaming store, and that's an hour and a half in the summer. See, I live in Alaska, so in the winter, that trip gets a lot trickier. But you don't have to live beyond the wall for that to be a problem. Before I moved to Alaska, I lived in a decent-sized city in Texas, but its location near the geographic buckle of the Bible Belt meant that people who were interested in magic and wizards and demons and the games involving them, they could be kind of hard to come by at times. If you find yourself in a similar situation for whatever reason, I think there are a few options available. First, if there is a friendly local gaming store in driving distance, even if it is a bit of a drive, you should consider going there. In fact, no matter what you decide to do with the rest of the advice in this video, you should definitely do this, if at all possible. The local store has been the sanctum sanctorum of tabletop gaming of all stripes for decades at this point, and even today, in our highly digital age, you know, this hobby does take up a fair bit of space, and it's not easy to find a place to gather and play a lot of the time, and the friendly local gaming store still provides that. Even though I live relatively far from my friendly local store, I still buy stuff from them even when I can't manage to get down there. It's gonna vary store to store, but the owner here is willing to work with me and ship stuff to me and all of that. And, and yeah, I could almost certainly save a bit of money buying all my stuff online, but I'm a big believer in supporting local business. And that's doubly true for a business like this that is so crucial to the hobby I've loved for about a quarter century now. Beyond that, establishing a relationship with a friendly local game store can really help you in your own efforts to build a community wherever it is you live. We'll get into more on that in a little bit. About a week ago, I put up a poll asking my viewers about their thoughts on me branching out into various other skirmish war games, and the usual suspects were in there, but I also left the forum open in case people wanted to make other suggestions. And Boy, did you! <laughs> I have gone down quite the rabbit hole in the past few days looking at various different systems, and I'm almost ashamed to admit it that, you know, I've been in and out of this hobby, like I said, for about 25 years at this point, and I've largely only stuck to the Games Workshop properties, and my most recent hiatus from the hobby lasted about 10 years, and in that time, Man, have there been a lot of other systems that have been brought up, and a lot. some of them are very small and independent, some of them are large and tied to other intellectual properties. One thing that struck me in particular was the proliferation of rule sets that allow or are even built around solo play. Uh, that became a particular selling point for a lot of systems during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it was even starting before that. And let's face it, the biggest barrier a lot of the times to actually getting models on the table is finding someone else to play with. Well, if you've got a set of solo rules, then you can kind of eliminate that potential barrier. Just a handful that I've come across include things like Rain and Hell, or Fallout Wasteland Warfare, or Planet 28, or Frostgrave, or Stargrave, or Five Parsecs from Home, and that's to say nothing for the board games that can be played this way as well. Um, Blackstone Fortress, or uh, <laughs> Hero Quest, which is just off shot over there, or the recently relaunched Cursed City. And these aren't just Sad Hammer, where you play both sides of a two player game. These have rules that are meant to, at least to some degree, automate the actions of the quote unquote bad guys that you're fighting against. And so it feels at least a little bit more of an immersive experience. If you have a favorite solo play rule set that I've left out, please let me know down below in the comments. If you don't wanna play solo though, to some degree you're gonna to need to build a community if that's just one person or a whole pool of people who can play amongst themselves. And that can be kind of a daunting task when you take it on as a whole. You know, back in the before times, up until about February of 2020, I was having a limited amount of success doing that. I was running a home D&D game, I was getting in games of Kill Team with people here locally without having to go to the game store whenever I wanted to bust out the miniatures. Then, of course, you know, 
If your goal is to jump straight into wargaming, then skirmish games are 100% the way to go when you're bringing new people in. Um, even the established properties that, you know, might have a little bit more complexity in the rules, Kill Team and Warcry, they're a lot easier to convince someone to get started with, you know, 10 models at a time than an entire 40k or AOS army. And from your end, since you're at least presumably going to be the one having to supply the miniatures for both players, it's a lot easier on your pocketbook and your painting time. On that note, I love 40k and the 40k universe as much as the next Wargamer. But if you're bringing in someone brand new, there are other options out there that might have intellectual properties tied to them that are more appealing to someone who's a novice to the hobby. Uh, I mentioned Fallout Wasteland Warfare earlier. If you've got someone who's already into computer gaming, there's a decent chance they're going to be familiar with the Fallout franchise. There's also a couple of other intellectual properties just on the tip of my tongue. There's movies. There's a mouse involved. Anyway, I'm sure I'll figure it out. All that being said, and as much as I love my miniature war games, the easiest gateway might be what hooked me all those years ago. I recently floated the idea in my community of having an introduction to Dungeons & Dragons event at a local arts venue, and I'll be honest, I was really surprised by how many people were immediately on board with that idea. I've had people from their teens to their 50s say some variation of, oh yeah, I've always wanted to try that, or hey, my insert relative here used to play and seemed to have a lot of fun with it. I've even had a handful of long dormant dungeon masters who I never knew had touched dice before in their life volunteer to help out. And again, I live in a really small town. If there are people like that here, I can almost guarantee they exist wherever it is you live. Now, I am fortunate in that I have an established relationship with the type of venue that's capable of hosting five or six tables at once for an intro event like this, but when I was running my home game, my actual home is way too small for that, as you might be able to tell by the roof line above my head here. Uh, but the local VFW hall would let us play in their side room. Or, you know, another bar would let us get a table in the back somewhere. Or if you live in a place that's not currently under six feet of snow, then you might be able to go to like a park and be outside. Now, I admit what I'm doing is probably a bit more ambitious than what a lot of people are going to want to try to do. But I guess if nothing else, I want to illustrate that if you're willing to put yourself out there as someone who's going to help organize, people will respond in many cases. Oh, and remember earlier how I was talking about the importance of building a relationship with the FLGS, even if you're not actually able to go there all that often? Well, guess who else has a vested interest in building a community of new tabletop roleplay or wargamers? Yeah, the people who were going to sell them the stuff. Now, the degree of support that your store is able or willing to give you eh, is going to vary. But at the very least, odds are decent they'll put up a flyer for you, or maybe they'll donate a door prize, or maybe they'll do what the owner of my FLGS is doing and is going to come up here in person, bring a bunch of books and dice to help put the event on in the first place. In fact, there's a second store that's just a little bit further away that I've actually never been to in person who caught wind of the fact that I was doing this and also wants to help out because Guess what? They also have a vested interest in more people playing the games they like to sell. Now, I've got plans for making this event happen in April of 2022, just a little over a month after I'm recording this, and it's going to take a fair bit of my time. In fact, I'm really just starting to realize how much I've really signed up for. Uh, so there might be fewer hobby videos than there would be in a normal period, but I'm going to be still doing things behind the scenes. In fact, I think I'm going to document a fair bit of what it takes to actually put this event on, and I considered making another channel because all the YouTube experts say, oh, don't broaden out too much. Anyway, I figured the Venn diagram of people who enjoy tabletop RPGs and people who enjoy tabletop wargaming is not quite a circle, but it's got to be fairly close. Anyway, I'm still going to keep doing 40k and Kill Team stuff like I have been, but I see this as an opportunity to also kind of branch out into other stuff. 
Games I'm currently actively taking steps toward getting content for are Marvel Crisis Protocol, uh, War Cry, and Conquest First Blood. But some of the ones that people suggested to me in that poll, especially the miniature agnostic ones, also have some definite appeal and might be making their way to the channel in the not too distant future. Also, a huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed to the channel. As I'm recording this, uh, we're very close to 1,500 subs, which is uh, a lot more than I would have expected at this point in the channel's life. So again, thank you. And until next time, hopefully this helps you find your way out of the desert, and thanks for watching.